All right, so it's this membrane, this uh, electrochemical gradient that we're going to concentrate on in the next, in this uh, this um, particular uh, video recording, um, as a means of active transport for nutrients uh, across the membrane. And a lot of times, nutrients are crossing membranes um, up their concentration gradients and up their electrochemical gradients. So, um, so we'll take a look here. <coughs> Um, just one thing to keep in mind is just to emphasize is that ATP phosphorylation is is what um, occurs with carrier molecules as you can see in the diagram channel proteins or channel uh, ch channel proteins are not ATP phosphorylated directly uh, they can in be involved in active transport but by the second means of uh, using a electrochemical gradient generated by a hydrogen ion pump uh, as do uh, carrier proteins so we're going to talk for a second here about this electrochemical gradient. Um, an electrochemical gradient uh, is, as we said earlier, a gradient in the concentration of a molecule plus the gradient in electrical charge. Okay. Um, and the gradient in the electrical charge is what sets up what we call a membrane potential. All right, so the idea here is that if we take a look at, let's say we're looking at a membrane, and let's say that this side is the cytosolic. We always want to label our sides of the membrane. Um, the cytosolic side of the of the plasma membrane, PM for plasma membrane, and out here is the extracellular uh, side of the membrane. Um, and as you know, the membrane itself is is hydrophobic, and the inside of the membrane uh, generally has this negative charge because of the presence of um, organic uh, anions. Um, Carbo uh, carboxyl ions associated with proteins and the extracellular side of the membrane um, kind of as a result has more of a positive charge to uh, to the membrane so that's what so there's this sort of natural um, membranes have um, sort of a natural uh, membrane potential or electric electrical gradient until uh, cations and anions start crossing over. So if we look at this from sort of say, you know, uh, ground zero from the from a baseline state, um, let's say we're looking at um, an accumulation or let's say potassium ions on one side of the membrane uh, versus another side of the membrane. Certainly we have a concentration gradient in that there are more uh, potassium ions on one side than the other, which is going to have a tendency to, to move down its chemical potential. So the chemical potential of potassium uh, outside is greater than the chemical potential of potassium ions inside. Um, and that's going to drive, certainly, the movement of potassium ions inside. Um, but what also drives potassium to the inside of the to the cytosolic side of the membrane is the differential in the charge here across the membrane, the membrane potential. So we tend to see potassium moving through to the other side, um, down an electrochemical gradient, not just a gradient in concentration or a chemical potential gradient, but also electrical uh, gradient. And that's what's referred to as this term here, the membrane potential. All right, so at some point, potassium ions are going to move into um, the cell, and then we're going to see a, an equilibrium um, that becomes the state here. Uh, and in this case, we're looking at an equilibrium, which is a balance in the chemical potential, in, uh, sorry, the, well, I guess the chemical potential of potassium plus its uh, electrical um, gradient or its, uh, its membrane potential. Maybe we should call that plus its membrane potential. Or actually, no, let's go back to that electrical gradient. Um, so it's not just an equal, equal concentrations, but now the balance between concentrations and charges that 
brings that uh, ion into equilibrium. All right, now, of course, we've talked about how before pl uh, plants try to avoid osmotic equilibrium, well, they are also needing to avoid this type of equilibrium here so that, mem so that nutrients can continue to be taken, can continue to be taken up by the, the plant. And that's where active transport comes into play. And so we aren't necessarily talking about ATP phosphorylation of a carrier protein in all cases because carrier proteins um, are less efficient, um, they um, are more specific, so there's a downside to relying completely on carrier proteins. So uh, carrier proteins and channel proteins can take advantage of the maintenance of a membrane potential which can continue to be generated, not just naturally here, um, but by what's called a hydrogen ion pump. And a hydrogen ion pump is a type of electrogenic pump, meaning that it, it continues to generate that membrane potential. And it does so by using ATP, being phosphorylation, um, using, being phosphorylated by ATP. Phosphorylation, there we go. So the hydrogen ion pump is basically an ATP pump. It's um, ATP phosphorylated to, to uh, pump hydrogen ions on one side of the membrane versus another. And so that is illustrated here in this next diagram. Um, and, in, and so here we see, um, we could call step one, is the generation of a membrane potential by a hydrogen ion pump. So we see a hydrogen ion pump here. It is ATP phosphorylated and it's pumping hydrogen ions from the inside of the, from the cytoplasmic side of the membrane to the extracellular side of the membrane. All right, and then step two <coughs> is what we see next. Step two, so here's one, can involve two um, processes, uh, one of two processes. One is here where we're looking at a uniport system where we have, in this case, a channel protein, which it could be very well a carrier protein, as far as I know, um, where once the, the um, membrane potential is generated, now we have a higher concentration of positive, or we have uh, a higher degree of positive charges in the extracellular fluid uh, than in the cytoplasm, which is going to drive the movement of potassium ions across the membrane through a channel protein up its concentration gradient balanced by its um, membrane potential. So the membrane potential is continuing to drive the potassium ions um, actively across the membrane. So these are this is um, all a demonstration of a uh, different kind of active transport than just being directly ATP phosphorylated. So the channel protein's not uh, directly ATP phosphorylated. It's the membrane potential that's generated by the ATP phosphorylated hydrogen ion pump that then allows the potassium ions to move um, across the membrane down its membrane potential, or across the, uh, a generated membrane potential in the membrane there. Um, another type of, um, so, so let's make sure we jot this down. So hydrogen or potassium ions um, move through a channel down its electrochemical gradient as a result of the hydrogen ion pump generating a membrane potential. Okay, so again, don't be confused by the fact that you see more potassium ions here. It's the membrane potential that's driving the movement of these potassium ions at this point. All right, another type of um, system that utilizes that membrane potential is shown in this next panel here, um, which is called co-transport. 
and there's a couple of types of co-transport, but basically the idea is that two ions or solutes, molecules, um, are transported, uh, transported, through one carrier protein. So, <clears throat> uh, one type of co-transport is called symport, and in this case, the as you see, the hydrogen ions are accumulating on the extracellular side of the membrane, and then uh, as a result of this hydrogen ion pump, and then the carrier protein has a binding site for both hydrogen ions as well as the nutrient that's being um, the uh, the addition the other uh, ion that's being transported across in this case nitrate so there are two binding sites and both of these um, ions are transported simultaneously across into the intracellular fluid um, so nitrate has a tendency to stay on the outside because of that negative charge internally but because it's moving along with this positively charged hydrogen ion, then it can accumulate in the interior. So this um, moves oppositely charged ions, hydrogen ions plus nitrate in this case, uh, but there may be situations uh, where other types of ions are moved across simultaneously with hydrogen in the same direction as well. Um, uh, across the membrane. Uh, there's another type of so we can not only we we not only see charged ions that are moved across, but also uncharged ions can be moved across by a symporter, um, such as sucrose. And we'll see this happening when we discuss phloem transport where instead of nitrate, it's sucrose that's moving through the membrane. Uh, a second type of um, transport, or co-transport rather, is um, called an antiport system. And I'm going to draw this kind of down here, where we have a, um, a, a plasma membrane. And um, we have that initial hydrogen ion pump that's pumping ions uh, across uh, from the cytosolic side out into the extracellular side. This is the cytosolic side um, to accumulate hydrogen ions here. And then we've got our co-transporter that's transporting hydrogen ions back across this direction, but transporting something else in the opposite direction. And so this would be an example of an antiport system. Uh, and this becomes useful for situations where sodium is um, transported out of cells, such as in uh, hypersaline environments. Um, also, when uh, the pH on one side of the membrane has to be maintained while, um, uh, let's see, while a uh, hydrogen ion is taken back up into the cell, um, taken up, and then also to um, lower the pH without changing the membrane potential. Lower the pH without changing a membrane potential. So these are examples of where using an antiport system would be helpful. So if we look down at the, 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 the last figure here, we can see sort of a summary of the various kinds of transports that we've seen. So you can see a, a, a hydrogen ion pump transporting hydrogen ions out of the cell, um, start generating that membrane potential. Um, calcium, uh, well, we'll come back to calcium. Um, that membrane potential can then drive um, potassium into the cell, as you see here, through channel protein. So that would be an example of a uniport system. Here we have our symporters um, transporting hydrogen ions plus various other substances, nitrate, potassium, um, phosphate, uh, sucrose into the cell in the same direction and our antiport system here uh, using sodium as an example. Um, uh, we can also see where c calcium would be phosphorylated to transport ca calcium out as, as, a, as a carrier protein that gets phosphorylated for, act for active transport.
So this just is a good summary diagram of all the different kinds of transport.